Dr. Hudson was a mail carrier when he discovered a simple truth that changed his life. Dr. Hudson says, if a person could hear me speak only one time, look and live is what I would want him to hear. Now, let's join Dr. Hudson as he speaks on Look and Live. Now open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 45 and your Bible's open now. Let's bow our heads for prayer and then the sermon. Well, our Heavenly Father, we love you. And I wish you were here to speak to this crowd. I'd like to sit in the congregation and watch you and watch your gestures and listen to your voice. I mean audibly, like those Emmaus disciples heard you. But you're not here. And I am. And so the best I know how, I yield myself to you for the control of my life. I pray you'll help me to think what I ought to think and to say exactly what I ought to say in this morning service. And Jesus, if possible, I'd like to say it in the very manner in which it ought to be said. I wish I knew how to preach. I wish I knew when to raise my voice, when to lower it, when to move, when to gesture. I wish I had perfect diction and an unlimited vocabulary so that I may express myself to my heart's complete satisfaction, but I don't. But what I do have, I yield to you and pray you'll bless me this morning. We pray you'll especially bless the conference in a mighty way. And may lives be changed and may people go out to win souls to Christ. And as a result of this conference, may there be literally thousands in heaven who would not have been there had it not been for these days at this great church. Central Baptist Church in Tyler, Texas. In Jesus' name, amen. This past year, I read an old biography of Charles Spurgeon written in 1890. And I always enjoy reading biographies of great men because I have an idea I may find something in the book that will give me an insight into their life, into what made them great, and I may can imitate that good part of that particular individual. As I read the biography of Spurgeon, I learned some things about him I'd never known before. It was the first time I'd ever read anything where he told about his salvation experience. I'd heard others relate how he was saved. But I'd never read where Spurgeon himself told about it. In the chapter about salvation, he said, I was under conviction of sin. I wanted to be forgiven. And he said, I made up my mind I'd visit every place of worship I could possibly attend until somebody told me how I may obtain forgiveness of my sins. Spurgeon said, I went to one place, and the man preached on, be sure your sins will find you out. But he never told me how I may obtain forgiveness of my sins. I went to the second place, he said, and the man preached on, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But Spurgeon said, he did not tell me how I may obtain forgiveness of my sins. He went to one place of worship after the other, and nobody made it clear to Charles Spurgeon how to be saved. He said one Sabbath evening, using his word, it was Sunday evening. He said, I'd intended to go to one place, but there was a bad storm, a snowstorm. The storm was so bad, he said, I could not go to the place that I'd intended to visit. He said, up a little side street was a primitive Methodist chapel. And Spurgeon said, I never really intended to go there. He said, I had heard about those people, and I had heard that they would sing so loud they would cause one's head to hurt. But he said, I made up my mind I'd put it with a loud singing if only someone would show me how I may obtain forgiveness of my sins. I went into the place, Spurgeon said, and there was only a few people present. As a matter of fact, the man who was supposed to preach that night could not get there for the storm. And they called on someone else. And he said the preacher went to the platform, opened his Bible to Isaiah 45, and read verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Spurgeon said, he looked down at me and said, young man, you're in trouble, and you'll never find peace until you look to Christ. And he said, as only those primitive Methodist preachers could do, he raised his voice and shouted three times, look, look, look. And Spurgeon said, in that moment, I looked to Christ and was forgiven. That was his experience of salvation. 
And he turned out to be one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. In fact, he may have been the greatest preacher since the Apostle Paul or since New Testament preachers. He preached when he was just a teenager and uh, Park Street Church. And a thousand came to hear him in 1200. He later moved to Extra Hall and 10,000 came to hear him. And then later that place burned. They moved to Surrey Gardens and 30,000 came to hear him in Surrey Gardens. The people said he's a teenager, he's a novelty, and when he gets older, this will wear off and the crowds will not come to hear him, but they kept coming. They finally built the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle, seat 5,000 people. And I have read you had to get a ticket two and three weeks early in order to get into the Metropolitan Tabernacle to hear Spurgeon preach. And on many occasions, he would ask all the church members to stay at home and, and make space for the visitors who wanted to come in here and preach. And they had pack and jam the 5,000-seat building with visitors just to hear Charles Spurgeon preach. Now, when I read his salvation experience, I thought, oh, that's rather unusual because my experience was not too much unlike Charles Spurgeon's. I went to church. I heard a man say, you must be born again. I heard what he said, but I had no idea what he meant. I even heard him say, you ought to be saved. If you're not saved, you're going to hell. And I, I knew hell was an awful place, a lake of fire. I knew that much. I'd heard that. But I didn't know what saved meant, and I didn't know how to be saved. And no matter how bad I wanted to be saved, I could not have been saved because I didn't know how to be saved. I prayed. I did everything I knew. But I didn't know to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. Nobody ever explained it to me. You know what? I think many, many multiplied thousands of religious people go to church. Sunday after Sunday, week after week, month after month, year after year. And many live and die. And they know about Jesus. And they know something about the Scriptures, but they really don't know how to obtain forgiveness of their sins. I think preachers even take it for granted that people know it, and they never bother to explain it because they think this sounds too, too simple. Well, at the risk of sounding simple, I want to take the text that Spurgeon heard and give you a simple salvation sermon so that no one listening to my voice can ever say, I went to church and I heard what he said, but I didn't know what he meant. And I didn't really know how to be saved, nor did I know how to obtain forgiveness of my sins. So looking at the text, I call your attention to four things. Number one, you have the source of salvation in the text. The text says, Look unto me, and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Underline the little word me, or circle the word me. Now doesn't it seem strange that I have to emphasize that? Salvation is not in a church. Salvation is not in a denomination. Salvation is not in sacrament. Salvation is not in ceremony. Salvation is not in rituals. Salvation is not in works. Salvation is not in reformation. Salvation is in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Scripture says, look unto me and be ye saved. Not look unto me and something else, but look unto me. And my most difficult job as an evangelist is getting people to look to Jesus Christ, Him alone, and nothing else for salvation. Up where I live, and I think here where you are, there's some very sincere people who look to Jesus and the baptistry. They want to put the baptistry in there with Jesus. It's not enough to look to Jesus. I must also be baptized. Now wait, I'm for being baptized. Everybody that gets saved ought to be baptized scripturally by immersion in a local church just like your church here. But nobody gets baptized to be saved. It's not looking to the baptistry. It's looking to Jesus. Don't you see that? I have been baptized. I believe a man ought to live right. I try to live right. But if I had to die right now and stand at heaven's gate and they said, Curtis, why should we let you in? I would not say because I live right. I believe I'd weep and say my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I'm wholly leaning on Jesus' name. And that angel would have an old-fashioned Nazarene Pentecostal Baptist slob and run and fit and say, Come in, boy, you've got the magic word that gets in this place. Jesus will not share saving people with any church, any denomination, any individual, not the Pope, not the Baptist preacher, no denomination, no sacrament, nothing else. He is the Savior, not one of the Saviors. 
Acts 4.12, Peter says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name given unto heaven among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the Savior. A missionary visited on a mission field and led a little boy to Christ, who, by the way, had religion and who knew about Jesus, but he added to Jesus many other things for salvation. A few days later, she saw the little fellow, and his countenance had changed. She smiled and said, Son, something's happened to you. You don't look the same. What happened? And he said, Miss Missionary, I always knew that Jesus was necessary, but I didn't know until the other day that he was enough. And I'm here to tell you in the whole world that Jesus Christ is not only necessary, He is enough. J-E-S-U-S, Jesus exactly suits us sinners. Jesus is the Savior. It's not what a man does that saves him. It's not what a man promises to do that saves him. It's not what a man quits doing that saves him. It's what a man has that makes him a Christian, not what he does. What must a man have to be a millionaire? Somebody answer out loud and tell me. A million dollars. Isn't that simple? Did you know if you gave me a million dollars, I'd be a millionaire? If you don't believe it, try it. Please. And I'll call my wife and say, Honey, you're married to a millionaire. I mean, just the snap of your finger, I could be a millionaire if somebody who had served with me and just said, here's a million, I'd be a millionaire the rest of my life because I, I'd only live on the interest, I'd keep the million. You see, it's not what a man does that makes a million, it's what he has. If a man must have a million dollars to be a millionaire, what must a man have to be a Christian? Christ, isn't that simple? And that's exactly what the Bible says in 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's it. If I wasn't so dignified, I'd shout and scream and spit all over the place, jump it up and down. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a Baptist or because I've been baptized or because I've tried to live good. I'm going to heaven because I'm trusting Jesus Christ. I'm looking to Him, Him alone, and nothing else for salvation. And you know something? There's no promise to those who partially believe on Jesus. The promise is to those who believe on Jesus. The source of salvation, Jesus. I believe in church. I joined the church. I tithe to a local church in Murfreesboro, Franklin Road Baptist Church. But I, I don't do any of that to be saved. I do that because I am saved and I love God and I want to do it to help propagate the gospel throughout the world through my own local church program. But I'm doing one thing for salvation. I'm looking to Jesus Christ, Him alone, and nothing else. Don't you know if there's any other way to be saved that God was a fool to let Jesus down on the cross and suffer what He suffered? And yet... Religion after religion after religion is trying to go to heaven some other way through baptism, through keeping the commandments. And I don't need to name these religions. Through sacraments, through ceremonies, through lighting candles and burning candles in the hallway. Everything has to go to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. If there was 10,000 ways to go to heaven, I'd want to choose the Jesus way. So when I got to heaven, I wouldn't have to praise anything else. I just had, I say, hey, I chose this way because when I got here, I wanted to praise Jesus, not some baptismal pool somewhere. And not the Pope or not the Baptist preacher, not the Presbyterian preacher. I, when I get up here, I want to praise Jesus, not somebody else. So I'm coming to Jesus' way to heaven. That's it. Why don't we all just jump up and down and shout a while and run up down the aisle? I mean, you have the source of salvation in the text, but you have also the scope of salvation in the text. Look unto me and be ye saved. Watch it. All the ends of the earth. Isn't that simple? Who can be saved? Everybody. Now, I, I get a little impatient with people who teach Calvinism and say some are elected to be saved and some are elected to be lost and some couldn't get saved no matter what because they weren't elected. I have never met a non-elected Calvinist. They're all elected. It's the others that are not elected. Now, stay with me. Yeah. Now, you ask any little first grader what that means, all the ends of the earth, he'll tell you that means everybody in the world. 
John 3, 16, God so loved the what? You ask any third grader what that means, it means everybody in the world. Hebrews 2, 9, he tasted death for every man. You ask any third grader what every man means, yes, it means every man. Nobody's excluded. It means everybody. But once you go to college and seminary, you learn that every man don't really mean every man. And you, and you learn that the whole world in 1 John 2, 2 don't really mean the whole world. It means the whole elected world. Now, that's a bunch of hogwash. Don't get mad. That's a bunch of hogwash. I mean, applesauce. <clears throat> Why don't we take what it says? Look unto me and be ye saved. What's the scope? All the ends of the... Salvation's for everybody. That's why I love preaching. If I sell automobiles, i got to find a prospect. Because everybody's not a prospect. If I'm selling real estate, i got to find a prospect. Because everybody's not a prospect. But when I'm preaching the gospel, everybody I meet is a prospect. Rich or poor, educated, uneducated, dumb, handsome, good-looking or ugly, you know. Everybody's a prospect for salvation. Jesus died for the whole world. That's the scope of salvation. Nobody will ever look out of hell up to heaven and say, Jesus, I want to be saved, but you didn't die for me. No, if a man goes to hell, it won't be because he had to go to hell. It'd be because he would not trust Jesus Christ as Savior. You not only have the source of salvation in the text and the scope of salvation in the text, but you have the simplicity of salvation in this text, and I love it. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. once said, Truth's most becoming garments are simplicity. And you know, people are not, are not confused because preachers have been too simple. But people are confused because preachers have been too complicated. Good preaching to me is not complicating a simple matter, but simplifying a complicated matter. Billy Sunday used to say, put the cookies on the lower shelf so everybody can reach them. And I like that. I have read, I don't know whether it's true or not, that Charles Finney really didn't start out as a preacher in a sense. But he went to hear other preachers preach. And they used such words that the average man couldn't understand them. But Charles Spurgeon, being a lawyer, could understand him. He was an educated man. And I'm told that Charles Spurgeon would, would, would gather people together and explain what the preacher had said in the pulpit. And he drew larger crowds explaining what the preacher had said than the preacher drew when he preached the sermon. And how true. Yeah. Make it simple where everybody can understand it. And salvation so simple we stumble over. We just can't believe it's that easy. Now, what does the text say? Here's what it says. Look unto me and be baptized and join the church. No, I added a little to that. Look unto me and live right. No, I added a little bit to that. Look unto me and turn over a new leaf and promise never to sin again. Oh, brother, I'm telling you right now, I wouldn't promise never to sin again. If that's what you had to do to get saved, I'd go to hell because I, I wouldn't get on my knees down here and say, God, I'm never going to sin again. I'd be lying. Don't you look so pious. You'd be lying to. I don't cuss. To me, it's the one sin that I, I'm not tempted too much with. I have been a few occasions. It's the one sin you commit and you don't get anything for it. If I'm going to sin, I'm going to steal something. So when I get through, I got something, you see. But when you cuss a blue streak, you ain't got a thing in the world when you get through. But I must admit, there have been a few times I wanted to cuss. I got behind a guy in a little Volkswagen, had all his windows rolled up, and he had a radio bigger than the automobile. He's at the red light. The thing's going wide open. And you could hear it back in my automobile. I thought, the guy is crazy. And he's into that music. Well, it wasn't really music. He's shaking his head back and forth. And the light turned green. He didn't even see it. He was so into that loud radio. I sat back there and blew the horn. He couldn't even hear my horn blowing with the music. He held me through three red lights. I was so mad. I never have cussed, but if you'd have written cuss words on a piece of paper, I'd have signed it. I was trying to find out how to run over a Volkswagen and a four-wheel drive pickup truck in some good Christian gentleman sort of a way. And when I finally did get around that guy, I stopped at the next red light and got out and raised the hood and held him through four red lights. I think I sinned. 
but it was fun. No, it doesn't say, look unto me and promise never to sin again. It doesn't say, look unto me and join the church. Now, you ought to join the church. You ought to try to live right. But you don't do that to get saved. You do one thing to get saved. You look to Christ. When Moses raised that brazen serpent in the wilderness, he said to those who were bitten by the serpent and doomed to die, look and live. I thought about that Old Testament story. Did you know you didn't have to have 20-20 vision to look? He didn't say, oh, you have 20-20 vision. Look and you'll live. But you folks that are blind in one eye, you, you don't have a chance. No, he just said, look. You could be blind in one eye and have no sight hardly in the other eye, but if you took what sight you had and looked at that brazen serpent, you lived. Why do I say that? Because people say to me, I don't think I have enough faith to be saved. It's not the measure of faith that saves. It's the object of faith that saves. You can take a little bitty faith and get a great big Savior with him. Did you know those that had 20-20 vision looked at the serpent, they lived. But those that had just a little bit of vision, nearly blind in both eyes, if they look, they live. You take what little quivering faith you have and look to Jesus, and I guarantee you, you'll be saved. That's the Bible. I can't hardly help and shout and think about it. Just look to Jesus and you'll be saved. Whatever faith you have. Somebody said, I don't have faith. One poor guy putting gasoline in my automobile. And I was witnessing to him. He had a cigarette in his mouth. And he said to me, man, I wish I had your faith. And I said, good night of livings. I wish I had yours. He had more faith than I did, but it was in a different thing, you see. I'm not trusting the church. My faith is in Jesus, Him alone and nothing else. And that's what it says. Look, I don't care if you have just a little bit of faith. Did you know every man here ate his breakfast by faith this morning? There's not a man in this room who put his breakfast through a chemical analysis before he ate it. You just sat down like a dumb idiot and dove in and started eating. You don't know that she didn't put rat poison in that food. And she probably has entertained the idea a few times. Blind faith, you trusted her. A lot of men have done that, and they're gone. <laughs> and if you think you ate by faith, I did eat by faith. When you eat in a restaurant, you eat by faith. I never send anything back in a restaurant. Never. If the steak's not done enough, I cut off the outer edges that are done enough and eat. I don't send it back. I have visions of what they do with it in the kitchen when you send it back. And it's not pleasant visions. I think the cooks get angry when you send it back and say, "What well, does he think he is? Spit on it and everything. I know. Don't send it back. And I have sat down at a table and noticed there's bread left on plates and pieces of meat. I mean, nice pieces of meat. I, I wonder, do they throw all that away? That seems like such a waste to throw all that away. So when you eat it, an evangelist friend of mine said, I don't eat hash at home because I know what's in it. And I don't eat, eat hash when I'm away from home because I don't know what's in it. And that's pretty good advice. Everybody has faith. The simplicity of salvation. Look unto me. Look to me. Look to me. That's all you say. Take what little faith you've got. If it just be the least bit of faith and say, I cannot save myself. I believe Jesus died for me, and I'm looking to Him. I'm trusting Him to take me to heaven. And you know what? You'll be saved. The word look means to depend on, to rely on. That same expression is found in Hebrews chapter 12, where the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Martin Luther translated that off looking unto Jesus, which has the idea of looking away from everything else and looking only to Jesus. It's looking away from my baptism, looking away from my works, looking away from my good life, looking away from my promises to do better, looking away from my reformation, and looking only to Jesus. That's it. Do I make myself clear? I'm trying. I'm struggling. I don't want you to trust anything but Jesus. I want you to live right. I want you to go to church. I want you to get baptized. I want you to tithe and give a double tithe and a triple tithe if you can. I want you to do all that stuff. 
But when it comes to salvation, I want you to say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'm trusting him, him alone, and nothing else to get me to heaven. The source of salvation, me, me. The scope of salvation, all the ends of the earth. The simplicity of salvation, just look. Just look. Isn't that simple? Isn't that too easy? Well, Jesus made it that easy because he did the hard part 2,000 years ago when he suffered hell at Calvary in a few hours' time for the whole world. And I can't get into trying to explain that except to say, since he was infinite, he could suffer infinitely. And he suffered more than I could describe if I spent the rest of my life trying to describe it. And he did it in those few hours while he suspended between heaven and earth as if rejected by both. The source of salvation, the scope of salvation, and simplicity, simply looking, simply trusting, simply believing, simply depending on Jesus. Number four, the surety of salvation. Look unto me and be ye saved. We use that word all the time. Sometimes an unsaved world won't understand our terminology, especially folks that don't go to church often. We say, so-and-so got saved. They think he's in a house on fire, and we pulled him out of the back bedroom window. Or he was drowning, and somebody threw out the lifeline, drug him in. The idea saved means you're saved from something. You save a man from a burning building. You save him from burning to death in a fire. You save a man from drowning. You drag him out of the lake and save him from drowning. And when a man is saved in the Bible sense, he's saved from the penalty of sin, which is hell, which is the lake of fire. To be saved means I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm saved from hell, the lake of fire. Don't you see that? And when I go to heaven, I'll be saved from the very practice and presence of sin. But right now, the moment I trust him, I am saved from the penalty of sin. Jesus paid my penalty at Calvary 2,000 years ago. Look unto me and be ye saved. Now, the Bible says that, but most religions teach you're not saved. When you look to Jesus, they teach you're put in a position to be saved, provided you don't mess up again, or provided you endure to the end, or provided you keep the kingdom of command. Now, now, you've looked to Jesus and you're trusting him, but if you mess up now, it's going to be bad. Well, it'll be bad if you mess up. But I know now you're going to mess up. I have four kids. I raised four. All of them messed up. I think some of them are still messed up. Only kidding. Only kidding. I have wonderful children. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you're going to mess up. I had, a, I had one kid said, Uga for water. And I thought he'd heard a Model T Ford come by. Uga. Uga. One day I was drinking water. He saw a glass of water. And he said, Uga. I said, I said, Uga, he said, Uga. I held down close. I said, Uga, he said, Uga. Uga. Want some Uga? Uga. He was saying, Uga for water. I didn't know what he meant. He messed up. But he learned to say water when he was 22. <laughs> How many times do they mess up? And God sure did mess up too. But we're not saved by not messing up. We're saved by looking to him. Look unto me and be ye saved. Not put in a position to be saved, provided you do this and do that and do that. And do, but look at me and be ye saved. Do you know when you're saved? You're saved. Did you know if you're in danger of being lost, you're not saved? You're just put in a position to be saved, provided something don't happen. If I swim out in the middle of the lake and drag you 90 yards and leave you 10 yards from the shore and then brag after I got back to the shore, I saved him. I hadn't saved you. I put you in a position to be saved, provided you didn't swim 10 yards. But I hadn't saved you. And if you look to Jesus, he says, now you, you'll go to heaven if you don't do this. And if you do that, if, he doesn't save you. He puts you in a position to be saved. If you can do this or if you can refrain from doing the other, he's put you in a position to be saved. No, when you look to Jesus, you are saved right then and there. And don't get mad, but you couldn't go to hell if you tried. Oh, you say, Brother Curtis, that sounds bad. I don't care how bad it sounds, you couldn't. When you get on an airplane and trust the pilot, you're going to make the trip. You can't get out. They've been several times. I wanted out. And if they'd give me a parachute, I'd have jumped several times. We left a place up in Arkansas one day on one of them little butterfly airplanes. And we took off, and the sky looked like it was down on top of us, and it was dark, and he tried to get out of money, and he didn't get out of money. It moved faster than we did. 
And we went up in it, and it was a mess. And the steward uh, is a man instead of a woman on there, and he, he buckled himself in and said, I can't help you. i got to sit down. <laughs> and I said, Lord God, we need some help up here. And folks began to grab for the bags. He told them where the bags were. He says, a little bag in the seat in front of you. He said, this kind of weather has the way of bringing the best out of folks. And I was making it pretty good to the girl sitting next to me. Let hers go. And then I looked the other way and across the aisle and was letting it go. And I just covered my face up then to keep them getting sick. It was a mess. But I couldn't get off. I done got on. When you trust Jesus Christ, did you know justification is an act that cannot be reversed and followed by condemnation? Impossible. Impossible. The source of salvation, Jesus. The scope of salvation, the ends of the earth. The simplicity, just looking, just trusting. And the surety, and be saved. You know I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. S-A-V-E-D, saved. Why? Because I'm looking to Jesus. I'm trusting Jesus. And if you look to him, you'll be saved. Don't trust anybody else. Trust him alone and nothing else. You've just been viewing a videotape of a message preached at Central Baptist Church in Tyler, Texas, entitled, Look and Live. The text was from Isaiah 45, 22, where the Bible says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. In the message, I've explained that to be saved, one must look to Christ. That simply means to trust Christ, to depend on Christ, to rely on Christ. To look to Christ means we look away from everything else, away from our good works, away from our reformation, even away from our church membership or baptism. And we look only to Christ. We totally depend on Christ. To accept Christ as Savior means we reject everything else as Savior. Christ is the only Savior. That's why the text says, Look unto me, and be ye saved. The sad thing is, the average person lives and dies and never really understands how to be saved. In Bible terminology, one must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Acts 16, 31. Again, it simply means to trust to depend on, to rely on. The same way I'm trusting this couch to support me. I put all my weight on the couch. I'm not depending on anything else to support me. I'm totally relying on the couch. One must trust Christ the same way. Dear friend, if I were in your home, the two of us together and alone, I would ask you if you would trust Christ as Savior. Since I'm not there in person, let me use this means of communication to ask you to trust Christ as your personal Savior today. If you will trust Him, then I want you to repeat a simple prayer with me. You need not pray out loud unless you just want to. But if you will trust Him, tell Him in your own words, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I do believe that you died for me. The best I know how, I trust you as my Savior. From this moment on, I am depending on you to take me to heaven when I die. If you've prayed that simple prayer and were right to tell me so, I have some free literature I want to send that will help you as you set out to live the Christian life. All you need to do to receive your free literature is simply address a letter to Dr. Curtis Hudson, Sword of the Lord Foundation, Box 1099, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, 37130. In the letter, say, I've viewed your videotape, Look and Live. I've trusted Christ as my Savior. Please send me the free literature. Be sure you include your name, address, and zip code. God bless you. And may your Christian life be one happy, wonderful experience.